Welcome to the Trusted Data Summit and our session now with NYU Data Quality Strategy. Uh, so my name is MJ Khan and I'm the Director of Alliances at Data Gaps. And I have the pleasure of welcoming Kasturi Sen to the stage uh, to give you a bit of background. Kasturi Sen is Data Governance Lead at NYU and Kasturi has been at NYU for 10 years. She started as a data warehouse architect before transitioning to data governance lead, which is her current role. And prior to joining the team at NYU, she worked at Johnson & Johnson for 12 years, along with a number of other companies. She's now been working in the IT sector for over 20 years. So we're not thinking about data governance. Uh, she reads fiction, watches movies, socializes, takes long walks by herself to meditate, which is, that sounds very nice. Um, so over to you. Story. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kasturi Sen. Hello, everyone. And um, I have been with NYU for a little over 10 years. Uh, before joining NYU, I had been to different companies wearing different hats as a data professional. I always um, worked as a like data administrator, ETL architect, data architect, you name it. And over the years, I have seen many, many data issues, resolved some, couldn't resolve some, sometimes resolved the same issue multiple times and took credit for doing it so fast. So everything we did, I did, and I, but one thing what I did not find, very rarely I came across a company where they actually have a consistent way of measuring data quality. This, that's what I never saw. Very, very few times I saw actually. So when NYU was no different, uh, when NYU, I was, we were doing the same thing. I was working as an ETL architect, data architect, resolving data issues. But five and a half years ago, data governance um, start, program started at NYU. So NYU didn't really have a choice. So data quality management is part of data governance. So I'm really happy to share our journey, our experience with, with the, everyone today. So thank you Data Gaps team to actually request me to participate in this and I'm very happy to participate. So what I'm going to talk about is of course, NYU data quality strategy, how we are defining the strategy and what type of framework we are using and a couple of data quality challenges and impact of the data quality, the, the issues on different systems, different areas. And I will also talk about the analytics platform architecture to show you exactly where we are applying the data quality framework and talk about the current and future data quality process, how we are handling it today versus how we are thinking of handling tomorrow and data quality process flow, actual process flow that we have put together. And then we'll, I'll share with you some views, Calibra views for data quality metrics and lineage. And since we started our journey, I will also share with you where we are in our journey, and then I'll recap. So how, why data quality, we're uh, working on data quality now. Five and a half years ago, data governance started at NYU. We tried a few things in data quality, doing some manual work, some ETL work and all that, but uh, this year, the difference is data quality is one of the key initiatives of NYU's data, enterprise data strategy. So we have, that is the main driver that we are focusing on data quality this year. And we have the business buy-in. So how are we defining data quality strategy for NYU? Typically, when you think about data quality, you have the data item, you apply rules, you measure how many passed, how many failed, then remediate, then monitor, and done. But NYU, we are extending that definition a little bit. We are, before we are applying the rules, we want to make sure 
that we know what data means, this, whether it has clear business definitions. Do we know where the data is sourced from? Do we know how many places it's implemented or used? How, what kind of policy is attached to the data item? Whether it's a privacy policy or data retention policy, what type of classifications, risk classifications, categorization. So all aspects of data should be known before we apply the rules. So all encompassing will determine the quality of the data. So data quality management is actually folded into the data governance process. That is our strategy. That is what we are trying to do. So we want to create and foster an environment where we have business glossaries for clear understanding of the data. We have we need a metadata management process where we are we have all inventory of NYU's metadata. We define the lineage so we know from source to target everything, including policies and procedures. Everything should be well defined. We need, of course the regular monitoring uh, and automated monitoring and alerts. And all the rules should be governed by the framework. And we need enterprise tools. That is our strategy. So what kind of uh, framework we are using? It's no different from any, any data quality framework. We define, define, define here usually, in quality, define means cre define critical data, define rules, but we are extending that definition to what I just said, that define the lineage, define what it means and everything about that data. And then we apply the rules in assess and we calculate the DQ scores, then error files and all the error reports. Then remediation comes when you, you talk to the source to find out you know, how, how are you going to remediate the issues and then continuous monitoring. So this is an iterative process, continuous process. This is a con continuous um, improvement process until the data is to some extent, I will not say 100%, but 99% data is good. So that's the goal. So I would like to share with you some um, fun things, actually, data quality challenges that we have. We have many, but I'm going to share a few. For consistency, we ensure ID cards are issued according to eligibility. So what happened a couple of months back, uh, the students from NYU, they graduated, but they're still assigned active badging badges, NYU badges. Active NYU badge means privileges. They're not supposed to get those privileges, but they were assigned. Why? Because all, even if they actually graduated, their enrollment records were still active. They were enrolled in the next term. So that was a mistake we found out later in the warehouse. Student workers. Student workers always have uh, um, records in student information system and HR system. And the official name at NYU, we use two types of names. One is preferred name, one is official name. So official names are all in uh, legal documents, I-9 records and all that, immigration records and everything. So most of the time what happens the student official names in student information system doesn't match with what is in hr in a human resources system so that is another challenge that we face all the time the budget amount coming from a different system where the proposals and research proposals and budget amount uh, comes from a system and then when it gets posted in finance they don't match and accuracy in student headcount, student headcount, employee headcounts. These are very specific things like specific counts that you will, depending on the context, it can be different. Student has a life cycle, student admitted, then enrolled, then um, matriculated, then graduated. So every step of the process, you know, the, the uh, life cycle, the student headcount uh, logic is different, but this is a problem 
because the student head counts in the reporting, they don't match because they are not we the logic of all the criteria that are defined in those um, headcount calculation no one knows really it's not clear nobody has the correct definition same with employees if i say today that uh, you know are you i want a list of current employees then someone will ask current employee means what employee was uh, I am the current employee. I could be retired tomorrow and then I can be again active because I can come back and start acting. So every status is different. For adjunct faculties, it's a different way of calculating the active because they have a different start date and end date. For some employees, there is a grace period that you have to take into account. So there are slew of logic out there and no one knows clearly what the logic means. And so therefore, uh, any headcount, employee headcount, call it student headcount, always is a problem. Again, uh, another system, our identity management system keeps track of all the um, in, entitlements, like if a faculty member wants to get access to the library resources, the entitlement is always kept in the identity management system. And it's not kept properly. So sometimes the people who are not supposed to get access to the library gets access and the other way around. So the student the faculty members who are supposed to get, they, they are not getting it. So that is, a, so these are the some, some challenges that we have. And I'm, I wanted to share that. So most of the time when we sit down and resolve issues, we don't uh, take a step, we don't take a step back and assess that how it's impacting how many systems or how many areas it's impacting, right? So one example of this is, like I said before, we have preferred name and official name. So now the policy dictates that we should use preferred name everywhere. All, all the downstream systems everywhere should get preferred name. Now, preferred name, it happened uh, about a month ago. There are some 100 records had some invalid characters in the preferred name. So what happened as a result? F 50 faculty members didn't get access to the library resource. 100 employees couldn't get into the building because the badge did not work. So the library system didn't have those records. The library, they, they didn't get to the resources. Employees couldn't get into the building. The badging didn't work. Students, some students could not get into the learning system. So they couldn't log in and attend the class. And students, some students also could not go to the gym because gym also gets the data and th those records were not there. So that's a downtime. I just only jotted down here or uh, show, showing you only a couple of downstream systems. So look at the resolution. Each analyst is looking at that problem, triages, and then refers every single one for a single problem. And then I have the developer, then comes the developer. So the developer, I have only have one developer, there could be multiple developers, and they all will be doing the same thing and resolve the issue. So if we take into account, if we don't forget about the downtime, just resolution piece and developer and the number of systems, and if you multiply by the hourly rate of the salary, then you do the math, how much time we spend just for tracking. One, one issue that could have avoided. Now, future process, we will be tackling this issue with the monitoring and only the data custodian will be responsible for remediation and everything. So we would be able to avoid this issue. So what is our um, analytics platform architecture? We have sources here. I have few here, HR, student, student affairs, so all these. And 
we different mechanism we use to land or stage the data and then from the staging we go to the repository repository is we have data vault methodology we use to create the data warehouse we also have um, ralph kimball um, fact dimension so this is the repository where we have um, we can do from staging to repository and from repository we go to the data distribution mainly it's done through api some data virtuality tool that sits on top of um, the database and there are other tableau reports can also um, access the views from the database so that's the architecture and the main point is every step of the process this um, uh, framework can be applied so and it, we should apply actually because if we do source to target we are uh, we are staging we are actually um, looking into all the source issues if we do staging to etl uh, or repository then we will find all the etl issues but for now for effectiveness we decided that we will do the source to staging because more or less we have seen that 70 percent of the issues will be resolved if we take from source to staging so current and future data quality process so current the client encounters an issue say for example library because i worked with library a lot so i wanted to use this example library uh, called us that there is issue some faculty members are not getting resources they can get to the resources and they should they are defining that they yeah this is the rule they should get it so the data professional looks at it and says okay this person changed the affiliation somewhere so therefore no he should not get it so he is also defining the rule here the rules are not very clear so they go back and forth and then finally it is resolved so all these all the steps are siloed and they all sit in um, like the inside the brain of the data professionals or the client who is talking and there's absolutely absolutely no monitoring same issue can pop up again and same process will start so with the new process what we are thinking we we know that it's going to reduce the notification client will receive less i'm not going to say that it will be completely 100 percent but it will be less notification and defined part will be the rules will be transparent clear defined once and for all so it will be defined once and then assessment is going to be automated so fully automated and then we have uh, the um, remediation part is distributed and through the custodians and monitoring is of course monitoring will be always there in the process so what are the benefits i think it got shifted this page here benefits actually say the trust that that is the most important thing because the clients are actually finding the issues before the data professionals and that is absolutely not right so improving trust is the most important thing then comes reduced turnaround time reduced downtime and increasing the transparency and all that and and after all this what we are trying to do is we are trying to create a process of continuous improvement. That is the benefit of the new process. So I will uh, say the, talk about the actual process, how we are doing it. So the data, uh, the first we create and approve the DQ rules, data quality rules in Calibra. Calibra has um, a workflow, very strong workflow uh, management system. So what, uh, when you create the rule and you assign the data custodian and data stewards for that particular data, 
the workflow will notify them that the rule has been created. So the, the custodian, data custodian and data steward, whoever responsible will be approving or rejecting the rule. So once that is approved, this process is a bit manual because you have to go to Calibra and create the rules. You can do other ways. I mean, there are templates you can upload, but the basic idea is you go to Calibra, enter the business rule uh, or data quality rule, the textual uh, rule, actually, textual description of the rule. Then the rule is approved by the custodian. It comes to automatically, it will be through API, API, Calibra API, it will come to data gaps. This is where actually the rule will be executed. Now, Calibra does not, Calibra is a metadata management tool. It doesn't have an option of writing actual SQL code or elaborate code. It's just giving you the rule name rule ID, all the information about that. This is a metadata of the rule. Actual rule, we are using data gaps to create the rule, to create all the, um, the SQL code, complicated code, everything will be done here. And then it, the execution will take place here. Error uh, files are going to be uh, generated from here and it will be stored in, in a database. <clears throat> And then from data gaps, the API, it will go straight to Calibra. And Calibra will have the data quality metrics. So what we are trying to do here, you may ask, why are we using two tools? Calibra is a data governance tool. And data gaps has um, data quality. This is what we are using, data, data gaps for data quality management. Now. Calibra also has a data quality management, but NYU did not purchase that because they have the same underlying architecture is the same because they go to the external um, vendor to do the calculation. But we NYU purchased and invested on Calibra for data governance practice, uh, processes. And NYU also is using the ETL validator and BI validator in data gaps. And data gaps has a very good, very good robust, um, I would say, data quality module. So we thought since our strategy is folding this whole thing under data governance, the data quality management folded into data governance, why not use best of the both worlds? And I would say that working, and I have been working with Data Gaps team uh, for over almost one year now to create this whole process. And I really, the partnership is wonderful and uh, we have really great relationship. And we have been, they also, Data Gaps also changed a few things to accommodate the, the needs. So we are using Calibra and data gaps to create the whole process. Now the, the DQ, the reports, reports we are using data virtuality tool. Data virtuality um, it sits uh, on top of any database and it doesn't store the data. It caches everything. So data virtuality or Tableau, depending on the client's requirements, that's what we will do. But from here, data gaps is actually creating all the information we are using in the reports. So that is our data quality process, combining Calibra and data gaps. So I just wanted to share um, some uh, Calibra view. This is the university ID is our NYU's universal ID. Everybody who is associated with, affiliated with NYU will have a university ID. So university ID is a business term. It has a clear definition. University ID is attached to the actual column to the table and the, uh, the source, source table actually, the where it's sourced from. 
And that we did, we had three rules defined for that university ID. And we calculated through data gaps. And here we can see the score of that. So this is a Calibra view lineage. Exactly what I said before, that our strategy does not only focus on the rules and the pass fail of the rules and calculate the percentage of how many failed, how many passed. It is encompassing everything. So this is university ID. University ID is in affiliated, this affiliations, whether student, employee, affiliate, alumni. And it has a synonym, where there is a call N number. We sometimes call university, ID, not university ID, N number is another synonym. And it has policies. And it is coming from the um, uh, column, from the table, the schema. So everything is defined here, the lineage. And it is it has these three rules. So this is how we would like to do data quality to show even with this business term here, university ID, if um, the data quality score is also attached to this one. I just don't have that uh, screen print here. You can see the 85%, whatever the score was, it, it, it will display here. So it is actually transparent and you can see the whole um, view of the quality of the data and what the data means, what the lineage is, and everything. So see, I, I said we just started the process. We, uh, we have been engaging other uh, groups. Now, identity management is the very important um, application in, um, at NYU because it keeps track of all the NYU person data. Uh, demographic data and also all the privileges. So we take that as a master data for um, all the NYU affiliates. Uh, affiliates, whether any NYU, when I say NYU affiliates, mean uh, student, employee, alumni, even parents of the students. They are all affiliates. So we have been working with them. We identified the uh, critical data, of course, and then we built the common definitions. Calibra has all the co common definitions. We have um, created the business term. Calibra has something that in any column will have only one business. Uh, many columns actually can have and point to one business term, and the business term will have the definition, business definition. So N number, university ID, sometimes empl empl ID or employee ID. There are so many different names we use, but they all go to the one business term and business term will have the clear definition that. So we define that and we, we know the ident identify the source system as identity management. We have initial issues. We created some. I created with them, and we did the apply the rules, and we created the dashboard that I shared with you. So this is where we are right now. We started actively since it is the one of the main initiatives now. We actively engaged the identity management um, to work on the rest of the remediation and monitoring. So this is where we are. So I just want to recap. I said many times that data quality is the one of the key initiatives of um, NYU's enterprise data strategy. And that's why we are focusing more on this uh, this year. And we will be working very, very closely with data gaps. There will be changes. And I'm sure the way we work, um, it is like we think alike. I feel that when we say something to data gaps and they understand, said, yes, this is needed for uh, this type of uh, requirements. And um, 
what we are doing with NYU's data quality framework is we are actually facilitating uh, understanding of the data through data governance to the Calibra metadata management system, automating the data monitoring. That's what we will do through data gaps and Calibra. And we are trying in this process, we are trying to embrace a model for continuous improvement. And lastly, I would like to uh, say this is my quote. I came up with this is data quality management process is a journey, not a project with an end date. So it goes on new data comes, new acquisition comes, new um, systems come. So always, always there will be data quality challenges. And so if my suggestion, if you don't have a data quality um, uh, team or data quality department or data governance department, then open one because the people who will be working in that department will have job security forever. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to share with you. Thanks everyone for your time. And uh, now I want to move over to um, Q&A. Thanks Kasturi for a very informative session. I really appreciate that. Um, We've got a couple of questions on here, um, sure. the ones I'd like to ask and uh, the audience would like to ask. So one of the questions for you, uh, Kasturi, mm -hmm. is how do you handle the orphan records in the data governance framework? When you see, yes, orphan records in data governance framework, um, orphan records means what? It's a foreign key relationship issues. If that is the case, then data quality absolutely data quality um, process will find those uh, for uh, orphan records and it will go to the source because we are doing source to staging. So what happens? I will give you one example, a reference data um, I'm using um, right now. I'm using the data quality management process to uh, clean the reference data. So say school code. We have school code, uh, there are multiple school codes. And, and NYU, you know, it's very de decentralized. So it has different schools, they have different codes. So now what we are doing is we are defining, this is the master. And all the codes, all the custodians from different systems, we are talking to them and saying, okay, this, we decided this is the master list and you have to conform to this. Now they are saying, no, we cannot because we have our systems. We already, codes are already um, uh, used by the system. We are not changing. So, okay, we said, fine, then create a mapping, a crosswalk. Now the crosswalks, sometimes what happens, the crosswalks are, they are not mapped. Some, um, some departments are going to be orphaned. Now, how do you deal with that? You need to work with the data custodian to see how where, where do you put those because there is a parent always there will be a master list and you have to actually work with the source to find out how you do this because this is not your data we are just checking the health of the data but you are responsible for taking care of it Thank you so much. That's uh, very helpful, um, Kasturi. Um, one other question for you. Um, do you see a priority to reconcile data across multiple systems in the source? In the source? In the source, yes. I would say multiple data in the source could be a different, uh, it is, depends upon the source. See, uh, I would say we are actually doing the data quality, in the repository where we are bringing in different sources into one place where we are sending everybody to the downstream systems, right? So the source, if they have multiple sources like student information system, if they are, um getting data from different systems so it's their responsibility whether they want to have crosswalk again or they want to have a mapping 
because otherwise in the country code if they want to have country code then i would go back to the reference data and we'll say okay define the master and then if you cannot use it then crosswalk it that's my solution because you cannot really change um if there are multiple applications depending on that particular code which which we are facing right now alumni has different um, school codes and sometimes they are rolled up schools they are not that granular do you dictate no you tell them okay do it but keep a crosswalk so that people know if they want integration to your system they can go through that crosswalk and find that um solution perfect thank you that's super helpful thank you so much for this informative session this story um really helpful and, and appreciate it such an important topic um for, for for us so i appreciate you taking the time and presenting to us mm -hmm.